Okay, welcome everybody. We're gonna get started with our workshop tonight. We got two items on our agenda tonight. One is the King County rate structure, and then we talk about the water system update. And uh, we're gonna have Tony Donati, Councilman Fletcher, coach me on how to pronounce it. Did I get it right? Yes. Okay. No, yes. Well, thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank you for the opportunity to be here uh, this afternoon to uh, introduce the upcoming King County rate restructure and replus programming. I'm Tony Donati. I'm the conservation coordinator here in the Public Works Department. Uh, today I'd like to introduce you to uh, the strategy performance section manager for King County Solid Waste Division, John Walsh. He'll be speaking to you about the new REPLUS programming in King County. And then also the strategy unit manager of the King County Solid Waste Division, Brian Halverson. And he'll be speaking to you today about the new King County rate restructure that's going to be going into effect uh, January 1st and how it affects residents here in Kent. Okay. So with that, I'll uh, bring up John. Great. Thank you. Hi. <clears throat> John Walsh, yeah, Strategy Performance Section Manager for King County Solid Waste Division. Uh, so I'm here to talk about RE+. Plus. Usually there would be like a GIF playing where there's like this cool, it says like RE and then all these words cycle after like recycle, reduce, reuse. Uh, it's, it's not happening, but uh, that's supposed to give you an idea of like what RE+ plus means, right? So it's really our, a new program focused on waste prevention uh, reduction. So because, you know, when you think about waste prevention and reduction, a word usually starts with RE, right? Reduce, reuse, recycle, repair refurbish, et cetera, right? So that's kind of the idea behind REPLUS, right? Um, you know, what, what we're trying to get at is REPLUS is really the way to capture all of these rewords, and then, uh, you know, the sentiment we want is before you throw that thing away, see if you can REPLUS it instead, right? So that's kind of the, the idea behind REPLUS. Uh, next slide, please. And I'll go kind of quickly because I know we're short on time, but this is just our mission and our vision statement. Um, really kind of the big takeaway is we have a goal to achieve zero waste of resources by 2030. Uh, about 70% of what's currently in the waste stream, so what gets thrown away is actually usable, right? It's things like food, cardboard, metal, and so we really just want to find a better use for that, um, for those materials. And so this is our mission. You can see it, it, it plays on those rewords. And then our vision is for a healthy, safe, and thriving communities in a waste-free King County. Uh, next slide, please. So REPLUS is a call to action. Here's a bunch of different county and city kind of documents where, where the zero waste of resources goal is listed, right? It's in our strategic climate action plan, King County code, uh, K4C commitment, comprehensive solid waste management plan, right? That's a plan that was adopted by cities and the county to kind of look at the next 20 years of our system. So it's all in there. And then we also have our King County equity and social justice strategic plan. So that's really about how we implement, right? We want to make sure as we're going uh, through this program, we don't want to leave certain people behind or overburden some folks. So we want to keep that in mind as we make decisions about actions and how we actually implement things. So um, I'm actually going to skip over the next three slides. So there are uh, some really amazing slides. Hopefully you get a slide deck. They're about a survey that we did um, of about 1,000 residents. And <clears throat> really, like, sort of the big takeaway is that people love REPLUS. So actually, yeah, you can see on this slide, uh, yeah, just uh, that's kind of like a before and after. So on the left, just hearing like a brief statement about REPLUS, it's already 63%. When they hear just a little more, that jumps up to 88%. So you can see residents in King County really care about waste prevention and recycling. So uh, that was just kind of a good check to see what sentiments are around the system. So uh, next slide, please. So just uh, before getting into some of the actions, here's some context, right? So we've, we've done some really positive things in King County, right? We were one of the first places to have a curbside collection of non-organic recyclables. Uh, recently, we focused on construction and demolition recycling. We also implemented yard waste collections, so did a lot of great things there. A couple things we're lagging on, though, is, you know, the sort of the typical way is it's weekly garbage and every other week uh, recycling organic. So we're trying to think, like, can we flip that around? Uh, extended producer responsibility. We're actually the only state on the West Coast that doesn't have this, right? So this would be a statewide thing where it's telling kind of Coca-Cola and some of those other producers to take more, you know, responsibility for the packaging they produce, right? Maybe make it more recyclable, do better education, things like that. Uh, so that'll probably come up in the next legislation uh, next year. And then banning food waste heading to the landfill. There's about 100,000 tons of food at the landfill, which is obviously too much, right? Um, the graph on the right, the green graph, shows our recycling rate last decade. So 54% is really good. I mean, the national average is about 32%. But you can see it's a pretty flat line, right? And if we go back 20 years, I think the growth rate is less than a percent a year. So we've hit a plateau, and so REPLUS is trying to break through that and, and create some new significant gains. So, uh, so this is the payoff if we actually achieve zero waste of resources. Uh, you can see about a half a million tons less going to the landfill, right? Way more trees because we're recycling that paper. Uh, that 100,000 tons of food, a lot of that's edible, so that's actually enough to feed 92,000 people. 
Big thing is it's a job engine creator, right? So you can see 500 plus green jobs created. We'll need people to pick up these new recyclables, process it, we need capital infrastructure. So it's gonna be a lot of jobs uh, that are created through this program. And then, uh, yeah, 150,000 fewer, fewer barrels of oil burn because we would have grabbed that plastic and used that instead, right? So um, next slide, please. So this is high level, I'm not gonna go into a lot of these, but we can provide more information later. But here's our kind of fast start actions. So this is a very complex system, right? There's different generators, the people that live at home, people at work, if you live in an apartment building, those are all different, right? There's many different materials, metal, wood, plastic, paper. Even within that, there's like subcategories, right? And then within those materials, some are recyclable, some aren't, some have end markets, et cetera. So it's like it's huge, like sprawling thing. And so we're trying to focus on kind of the, the biggest impacts first. So you can see we chose paper and plastic and then organics, which is food and yard waste. That makes up over 50% of what's currently being thrown away. So that's why we're focusing on that. Um, it's kind of broken down into four general areas, right? One is legislation to, um, to increase waste prevention. So this is that thing like EPR I just talked about. That's that Renew Act. Uh, organics legislation in the organics column, that actually just passed this year. So there's statewide legislation that's uh, meant to improve collection of organics and the end markets for those organics. Uh, single family collection, we're looking at within King County, within unincorporated areas, like can we change code to do different service levels to actually have people uh, subscribe to services, right? Support for organic services, because not a lot of people do that. Uh, we might look at that every other week thing. So we're kind of exploring some different um, county options there. Uh, another area of interest is financial support for businesses and cities. So that's where you can see, you know, we want to tap into the entrepreneurial spirit in the area, right, and kind of like get some businesses off the ground. So Next Cycle Washington, that's the thing on the bottom, that's a business incubator. So get new businesses off the ground. Circular Economy Grants, we've set aside two million of our own money for this. And so that's to help those small, medium-sized businesses get to the next level. And then we have Replus City Grants, which is a separate pool of funding, and that's for cities to help, help you guys with your recycling and waste prevention efforts, right? So uh, we got a lot of financial assistance there. Another one is increasing processing. So non-residential food waste recycling, really got to work on that name, but that's really taking like all the food waste from businesses and finding another use for it, right? Instead of just composting, can we anaerobically digest it and create energy? Racy just trying to find some new options for food waste. Um, mixed waste processing is kind of the last screen. So we want people to source separate, right? Put in the right buckets, but we know people aren't going to do that all the time. So this is kind of using robots, cameras, conveyor belts to get at some of that, you know, whatever's left and still has some type of kind of value, right? Um, and the final thing is just engaging more with the community and city. So we have a community panel right now. It's uh, made up of 10 frontline members that we've been meeting. So we've had kind of like storming norming going on, building trust. And so eventually we want to uh, work with them on kind of future actions and, and, again, how to best implement some of our actions. And then city-county collaboration, that's something we used to do pre-COVID. And so we're kind of resurrecting that with the um, uh, recycling coordinators of each city and just trying to get on the same page about uh, communications and messaging. So. Next slide, please. So this is the impact of all those, or you know, estimated impacts anyways. Again, diverting 300 to 400,000 tons of waste. Uh, that translates into 200 to 300,000 metric tons of CO2 equivalent. Uh, I looked it up, 300,000 tons of that is actually like the equivalent of a car driving 744 million miles. So that's kind of a way to sort of frame it, put it in perspective. Um, so it's all great. There are some considerations though, right? It's gonna cost money to do this, right? So you may see some rate increases. It's gonna uh, require behavior change, people putting it in the right bin. Uh, as I mentioned before, though, there should be an increase in jobs, of local jobs, to help process all that stuff. So, and then this one, this is another thing from the survey, but just to point out, out of all those actions I talked about, you can see very high support, right? Uh, between 75% and 94% for all these actions. So again, residents, when they hear about it, they're, they're very interested in some of the work that we're doing here. So um, that was a very fast flyover. So, uh, you know, happy to take questions or, yeah, if there's any follow-ups, happy to answer those later too. But... Um, hey, great presentation. Yeah. Um, I'll, I'll probably take this on to my wife because she, either, if I put something in the wrong bin accidentally, <laughs> she'd make me go dig it out. Yeah. So, uh, so I'm going to take this presentation home to her. But yeah, great sure. job, and thank you guys for going in the right direction. Yeah. So thank you cool. so much. Great. Thank you. Uh, we got a question here, Council Member? Okay. Let's do Council Member Lamer, followed by Michelle. Sure. So, uh, question. So, I, you know, in my social feeds and stuff, I'm seeing a lot of these for profit uh, recycling alternatives for the things that aren't taken today. Is the idea basically to, that we'd be competing with these and take, eventually taking the same type of things? And like one thing that comes to mind are, you know, I have a, I have a boy, so like torn jeans, I can't donate them. I, you know, how yeah. do I can't recycle them? Um, you know, so is that the idea that kind of going into the same business as some of these for profits? And I, I don't love like donating something to a for profit necessarily. So uh, I would say the. 
the grants and the next cycle are really trying to cre help create those businesses, right, to fill in those gaps. I don't think, like, it's not like the county's trying to necessarily get into a space that for-profit wants to, wants to take on, right? But it's kind of providing that financial assistance. Um, you know, maybe examples, Ridwell, right, they're kind of a smaller company, so it's like, I mean, I don't think, I don't know if they applied for the grants or not, but that's a good company where a good example where like maybe there could be other types of companies that fill in those spaces uh, and can get at that waste because it's not always easy to you know put in the right bin or yeah take it to the target you know to recycle plastic bags things like that. So if there's other opportunities, other competition we can create, I think that's what we're trying to do. Great, thank you, uh, Councilman Michelle. Thank you, Council President. I'm that person going through the trash at home, <laughs> putting things where they belong. I was going to bring up Ridwell, too. Yeah, they fill in that gap sometimes. Um, great. I love it. Great presentation. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. Any more questions? I think that's it. Hey, John, appreciate it. Good job. Yeah. Thank you so much. Great. Thank you. Oh, so next up is Brian. So he's going to talk about the rate restriction. Okay. Yeah. Good evening. I appreciate your time this evening. <clears throat> so... One of the reasons we need to do uh, the rate restructure is because we expect REPLUS to be uh, not only popular but a successful program. Uh, the problem with that is that 90% of the revenue for our uh, division comes from uh, when folks take trash to the landfill, take it to the transfer station to the landfill. And if REPLUS is successful and reduces, uh, takes 70% of that trash, it's lost revenue, right? So we can't operate uh, under those conditions. And the majority of our costs for our division are fixed. They're things like, you know, debt service for building transfer stations, uh, vehicle replacement, things like that, construction of uh, at the landfill and what have you. So uh, while we have a very variable waste, uh, excuse me, revenue stream, we have a very fixed cost structure. Next slide, please. And this is just sort of a, a graphic example of what would happen uh, if REPLUS to the rates, if REPLUS was successful versus whether uh, uh, or if it is not. So the, the tonnage line there is the dash line that's going down. The gray line is what happens uh, to the tipping fee if the tons don't fall. And you can see what happens if they do fall. You're looking at in uh, 2026 a $400 per ton tipping fee, which is obviously something we really want to avoid. Um, next slide, please. <clears throat> so what we've done with the race restructure, what was adopted back in March by the King County Council, is what's called what we call a fixed annual charge, or FAC. Basically, what, what we typically do when we're setting rates is we say, okay, what's our revenue requirement? How much money do we need over the next uh, year or two years for the biennium uh, to run our operation? And then divide that by the number of tons, and that's how you get our tip fee, essentially. I mean, that's, you know, basic terms. But that's the idea. Uh, what we're saying now is, all right, well, we've got this, this amount of, of money, and we're going to divide it by the tons, but let's first set aside a certain amount. That's the fixed annual charge, and say, we're just going to collect this no matter how many tons we get. So it essentially fixes that part of the revenue stream. And then we take the rest of that revenue and divide it by the tons. So what you end up with is a lower tipping fee and uh, and then this additional fixed annual charge. And the fixed annual charge then gets shared out to each service area, which is kind of the, the legalese for each city or each yeah, sort of collection area, everywhere there's a contract uh, with a hauler. <clears throat> and, uh, and so the idea was we want to, we want to create a structure that doesn't, doesn't uh, collect more revenue, it's revenue neutral essentially, right? So as we increase the FAC, the fixed charge, we lower the tipping fee per ton. Next slide, please. And this one, we'll kind of skip over this one, but this one gives sort of a nice round numbers, easy math uh, example. But let's go to the next one because it shows essentially the same information here but for Kent. So if we're looking at 81,360 tons uh, for the year for Kent, and if you look at the, the last line on the bottom green table there, you can see that's about 12.3% of all of the transfer station tons that we expect, right? So uh, if the FAC or the fixed annual charge is 21.8 million, 12.3% uh, of that is 2.688 million right there. So that's uh, second to last line on the right. So on the left, what you see is sort of, that's the status quo. Here's the tons, multiply it by $169 a ton, and the total cost to Kent is 13.7 million, 13 million in disposal costs. And in the new system, we say, all right, well, we're going we're gonna to, again, carve off that fixed annual charge. We'll charge that separately. 
and then we'll take the remaining tons uh, and divide it, or excuse me, the remaining revenue we need and divide it by the tons, and that gives us a lower tip fee of 136. So it's still that 81,360 tons, but it's multiplied by a lower number where you get the 11.03 or 04 uh, million. Then you pay this fixed charge separately, and we're looking at having that uh, be a sort of monthly installment sort of a situation. Uh, and then you, you see the total cost ends up being the same. It's, it's revenue neutral from the status quo, because that, that's the intent, is to keep it revenue neutral for the restructure. Now, just to be clear, we, this was passed in March uh, with, some, with rates under the new structure for 2023. However, there's also a 23-24 rate proposal in front of council right now, which we hope they'll uh, take up. I think the Budget and Finance Management Committee takes it up uh, in a couple of weeks, and then shortly after that, the council will take it up as a whole. Uh, and that is a, a rate increase proposal, which is separate from the rate restructure that passed in March. And the, way we, the reason we did it that way is for two reasons. One, we knew that cities would need time to work with their haulers to update that contract to account for this new FAC, which there isn't language uh, currently in the contracts to handle. Uh, and because we wanted to sort of separate what the rate restructure is doing from a discussion about increasing the rates. Uh, and that's why uh, essentially we've done it this way. And, and I'll, I wanna just point out the notes here at the bottom uh, that your staff are working with Epicenter Consulting right now uh, and we provide some money from the county to, to help you be a sort of a pilot city so that those smaller cities that maybe don't have the staff or the time to work as in-depth on contract updates uh, as Kent has will be able to use the templates and the information that comes from this process to help ease, ease their transition into the new restructure. And then, of course, the rates uh, shown here are part of the 23-24 rate proposal, which is not official yet. If they do nothing, then rates will change because they'll move into the new restructured rates, but essentially we'd be collecting the same total dollars in 23 as we anticipate collecting in 2022 um, if they don't pass uh, the rate proposal that's in front of them right now. Uh, next slide, please. So how cities are impacted, uh, city hauler contracts will be updated, that's something you know. Uh, billing systems may need to be, uh, I think Kent does, or excuse me, Kent's hauler does the billing uh, for the city, so that won't be something hopefully that you'll need to worry about. Communications though, this may be something depending on, on whether or not uh, your billing now has a separate line item for FAC uh, or not. Uh, that, may, that may be something that you'll want to communicate to your residents. We have committed to preparing sort of a one pager that can be dropped in with uh, uh, haulers if they're, if they're willing to include that as information and we can provide that to the cities as well uh, if you'd like to have that. So those are, are really the, the main three uh, impacts and, and the top one is probably, uh, for most cities, is probably the, the one that folks want to pay the most attention to. Uh, next slide, please. I think yeah, that, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to answer any questions. My, or my, my information is up there as well, and as Tony knows, he's reached out to me and, and I'm happy to take any questions. Or Do we know what the impact can be to the customer, the citizen, with all this here? So for the rate restructure itself, uh, it could be nothing uh, or it could be something. It really depends on the con how the contract sort of divvies out disposal charges to the different types of customers you have, right? Residential, multifamily, commercial. Some cities and haulers agree to charge more of the disposal cost to businesses than they do to residents, uh, sort of per capita or per ton. Others don't, uh, and some may be going the other way as well. As we saw during the pandemic, when commercial tons dropped because businesses were closing, it became a real financial burden for the haulers, and it was really hard for them to deal with. So that may be uh, less desirable. But the, the, the rate restructure itself, since it's not collecting more money than we would under the status quo, shouldn't affect residents other than any changes in, in the nature of sharing those disposal costs with your residents. The new uh, rate proposal to increase rates yep. that should be uh, uh, reviewed here in, in September, we're looking at on average across the entire uh, service area, the 37 cities, is about 71 cents, I think, uh, per month on the typical residential bill. Okay, thank you. Any, any question, council member? We're good? 
You guys did a good job. I know you was at this level, but we get it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Much. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming. All right. Cool. We're going to move on to our last item here, and uh, this is the uh, water system update. Sean. My stuff's clean. It's not garbage. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Thank you, Council President. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Every year around this time, we'd like to uh, provide you with an update on what's going on in the water system. Uh, so tonight, I'll touch on water supply, water quality, uh, challenges we're facing, projects we've completed since the last time I was here, and things we're working on. So our water supply sources have been really strong this year. We had a very wet winter and spring. You guys all saw that. Uh, and a late onset of summer weather. We operate 16 wells, two springs in our surface water supply from the Tacoma Regional Water Supply System. For our Tacoma Green River Supply snowpack, this year was about 109% of normal, and the Army Corps of Engineers reached a full pool behind uh, Howard Hansen Dam on June 22nd. Uh, we began using the stored water on July 11th. For our Tacoma Regional Water Supply System, the Howard Hansen Dam Additional Water Storage Project project continues to move along. I've been talking about this for many years <laughs> in my update. A director's report and certified cost estimate uh, in the amount of $855 million were completed earlier this year. So both the House and Senate versions of the 2022 uh, Water Resources and Development Act, or WERDA, uh, include authorizations for the project. There hasn't been a final WERDA released yet, but both of those um, have this project um, in it. So that's good for a that's good for our supply. Uh, the project also received $220 million in funding from the Infrastructure Investments and uh, Jobs Act signed by President Biden in November. The Corps is working right now on a budget for the design phase and there's a few things left in the timeline. Uh, they've got uh, pre-construction engineering and design uh, that needs to be completed by 2025. They need to complete the design by the end of 2027 construction completion by 2030 and begin passing salmonids by 2031. So the Corps is working on interim measures until the fish passage is put in place to manage flows through the dam to um, help protect fish. Water, water, I'm oh. interrupting for a second. Oh. Okay. I'm going to interrupt for a second. Uh, just briefly, this is a big deal. This is uh, making sure that we've uh, secured the water rights to the, to the area up behind the dam. Uh, also, uh, as Sean pointed out, uh, if, and if I remember, if I get my fact correct, Mike, we're going to be at about 50% of the habitat available uh, to salmon is above the dam. Say that again? 90%. 90%. So, a uh, huge improvement. And we're on the hook for about $4.5 million for the improvement. We have to make sure the federal government funds the rest of the improvement. but really a big deal for us. This is about making sure we secure salmon stock for decades after this. So this has been discussed, as Sean said, for like better part of 30 years, uh, really hard for 20 years. And the fact they got into the federal legislation just in this last few years is very exciting. So, you know, we're water purveyors and engineer guys. So we don't get very excited, but we're pretty excited about this. <laughs> Mike's excited. <laughs> so, I mean, big numbers, $855 million and, uh, if everything works out right, uh, we'll have fish running up there into that upper reservoir and spawning for, for decades. Awesome. Thank you. Water system demand this year started out with average water use, but as the wet and cool spring conditions continued, we dipped below our five-year weekly minimum average, as you can see by the black line on the uh, chart up there. With the recent warm, dry weather, it's brought us back to normal to average conditions. Our peak day demand so far this summer has been 11 and a half million gallons. And last year when we had the big heat wave, the max day demand was 12.5, so about a million less. Our annual water quality report was completed earlier this year and was available the first week of May in conjunction of uh, National Drinking Water Week. A postcard was delivered to our customers, letting them know the report was available to view and provided a link to view it. And there's a printed copy of the report that's also available to anybody that requests it. The report contains information on where our water comes from, how it's treated, and what was found in it through testing. We also take the opportunity to pass on information relating to wellhead protection, water conservation, and water use efficiency 
cross connection protection, water system accomplishments over the previous year and things we're working on. Water treatment chemical costs continue to increase. We started seeing that last year and it's continuing this year. Raw uh, material cost increases for the products we use uh, in the or that are used in the manufacturing of sodium hydroxide, which is used for pH adjustment, and chlorine, which is used to disinfect and protect the water supply. Uh, they've raised 33% this year. In addition to cost increases for treatment chemicals, the cost for water parts are on their way up as well, along with long lead times for delivery. Things like pipe, valves, fittings, water meters, fire hydrants have all had delivery times of four to eight months this year. So staff have done a great job working with our warehouse to pre-order parts for our projects and to keep extra parts on stock for emergencies. Here's another one we've talked about quite a bit. Over the past couple years, I've talked about upcoming rulemaking for per and polyfluoroalkyl substances or PFAS. These substances are used in a variety of manufacturing uh, processes and in firefighting foam. The State Board of Health set action levels for five of these substances last year, and earlier this year we collected samples at all of our sources to test for them. The testing was paid through uh, by a grant from the EPA, and we found two very low uh, detections in our sampling. At East Hill Well, we saw a detection of perfluorobutane sulfonic acid <laughs> at a level of 2.17 parts per trillion, and the action level that was set for that is 345. So it was 0.17 over the detect limit, but it was still there. But the sampling for this stuff is really uh, technical. I mean, you have you can't wear clothes that have had uh, laundry uh, fabric softener in it. Um, there's all kinds of stuff you got to follow. So we will be retesting in the future and uh, verify those numbers, but uh, not at this time. Uh, we also found at Kent Springs a detection of perfluorooctane per sulfonic acid, or PFOS, at a level of 2.28 parts per trillion. Uh, the state action level for that one is 15. So in addition to routine maintenance activities such as water main cleaning, hydrant exercise, uh, exercising, distribution, valve exercising, uh, there have been a few projects that we've completed since the uh, last time I was here last year. Go over some of those. Uh, we had two water main projects on Fifth Avenue South, one last year and one proposed for this year. Uh, we finished a water main project on South 268th Street up on the West Hill and one on First Avenue North uh, between West Cloudy and Cole Street. We also added 12-inch uh, connections on a 16-inch main on Kennebec Avenue at East Meeker and East Ward Streets for some upcoming 12-inch water main projects. A 6-inch water uh, main was replaced with 12-inch uh, water mains on Bolsar and Titus between Central Avenue and Railroad Avenue for increased fire flow availability. These water main projects are, are, are a series of uh, projects identified in our modeling from our water system plan update a few years ago, and they help move water across the valley and up the West Hill. Just like long delays in water parts, we're seeing long delays in uh, PLC parts, programmable logic controller parts, up to eight months for those as well. We had two PLC projects scheduled for this year and one, one of them at Pump Station 7 on the West Hill and one at our East Hill Well. The parts for Pump Station 7 were received, so that project was completed and the, and the PLC was upgraded, um, but we're still waiting for the parts to come in for our East Hill Well project. Clark Springs Generator and Electrical Upgrade project was completed, and uh, we now have complete backup power generation at our Clark Springs site, along with a new automatic transfer switch motor control center, and uh, control system upgrade. Our Giberson, uh, our water res reservoirs were cleaned and inspected every five years. Giberson Reservoir had been lined with an HDPE lining uh, about five years ago, so it was due for an inspection. Um, it was put in place to stop uh, leakage that was collecting in the underdrain system. Uh, so it was drained and inspected, and after it was drained, the seams and the liner started to separate. You can see that in the middle picture there. That's one of the seams. Uh, the company that installed the liner came in and repaired the seams, but we continue to see water collecting in the under-drain under system and are working on a relining project for this winter for that reservoir. This liner is a temporary fix in, uh, 
until funding is in place to replace the reservoir, the replacement cost for that reservoir is probably about $15 million. Our Armstrong Springs well rehabilitation project is also complete. The well screen and casing were cleaned and inspected, and a new vertical turbine pump and motor were installed, uh, mirroring what was um, uh, replaced, what was in there before. HCM8 is a habitat con conservation measure within our Clark Springs Habitat Conservation Plan. It sets aside money for habitat restoration and improvements uh, projects along Rock Creek. The city purchased a property along Rock Creek known as the Phillips property back in November of 2020 and worked last year on the demolition uh, of the building structures. This year the city purchased the last property along Rock Creek that is part of this project called the McEldery property. And so we will open on that next year. So those were some of the highlights of the bigger stuff that was, uh, was completed over the past year. And I'll touch on things we're working on going forward. I know Council Mem Member Fincher's waiting for West Hill Reservoir to come up. <laughs> <laughs> Our six million gallon one tank recoding and structural improvement, um, improvement project kicked off this spring. Uh, this project includes many structural upgrades uh, and safety improvements, a new vent that meets the Department of Health requirement, uh, seal welding on the interior of the tank. You can see all those cross members along the ceiling. Those weren't welded together. They were just sitting on it, and so rust can get underneath it. So by seal welding all that, you can get a better coating, and it'll last longer and increase the life of the structure. We also are adding a, a rain gutter system to the outside. That tank gets good, uh, really dirty, and we have to clean it a lot. And so that decreases the life of the uh, coating as well. And so hopefully that'll uh, help extend that life. Uh, the project, uh, they're working on painting on the interior currently, and they'll be moving to the outside, uh, setting up scaffolding. And, um, and yeah. So th this tank is our endpoint for our Clark Springs source. So water comes from Clark Springs, it goes in this tank and it goes to many different uh, other places. It's pumped to our 485 pressure zone. Uh, it uh, feeds down to our six million gallon two reservoir at Garrison Creek Park. And it also is pumped out of the tank and put into the 590 pressure zone up on the East Hill, which also feeds our 640 pressure zone. So with that tank not being online, the water can't go there and be available for pumping. So we're in an alternate operation right now where we're bypassing uh, everything. We've got a PRV down in the valley open, so continuous amount of water is flowing. And then when the reservoir at Garrison Creek calls for water, it just increases the flow. So the guys have done a great job this year, um, trying all kinds of different source positions and moving things around, making sure if something happens here, we can move things there, all that type of stuff. They've been doing an awesome job. Kent Springs uh, Well 3, uh, we continue to work through well rehabilitations at our sources, uh, pulling pumps and motors, checking the condition, rebuilding them or replacing them as the need be. The well casing and screen are video inspected and then the well is cleaned based on the conditions that are found in the inspection. Uh, so far brushing and baling have been uh, successful, no other, nothing, no other methods have had to been used because there's other options like injecting air or chemical uh, treatment. So Kent Springs Well 3 is our current project. The well pump and motor were pulled and inspected. The motor was uh, rebuilt, but the pump needed to be replaced. So we're waiting for that pump to come in, and it's expected about mid-September. Clark Springs Well number 1 and number 2 will be up next after uh, Kent Springs Well 3 is complete. As I mentioned earlier, water in Giverson Reservoir is getting past the liner and collecting in the underdrain system, so we'll be working on a scope of work and going out to bid to replace the liner this winter. Habitat conservation measure number five out of Clark Springs, out of our uh, habitat conservation plan, is a project to replace non-fish friendly culverts on the Summit Landsberg Road out in Maple Valley. Uh, construction kicked off on this project in June and is progressing really well. The road is currently closed for the project with the expectation that one lane will be open by September 1st for school and fully open by October 31st. Sean, Councilman Fincher have a question. I, I had a question on the liner. So the liner is leaking and it was discovered to have been leaking before. Wondering about warranty, are we on the hook for that entire price? Have we looked at to see if it was installed properly? Is it end of life since it has to be inspected? But I'm, 
I would think it has to be inspected, but it's supposed to last longer than five years. Right. So it's been in there for five years, and they came back and did repairs to it, and we just can't figure out where it's coming from. So that's one of the things we'll be working on this winter. We needed to get it back online for the other uh, reservoir project, um, and so we couldn't we couldn't keep it offline. So, but when we filled it back up, the leakage, I think it was like five gallons a minute, and over time it's dropped back down to a gallon a minute. So it's back to about where it was. So it's pushed itself back together wherever that seam separation seems to be. And does that include looking at the manufacturer or is, again, is the cost all on us or is there any responsibility that can be shared on that from the way it was put in, seal, or is it just, what is the financial? We're still looking into that. I'm not okay. sure yet. So with the purchase of the McElderry property earlier this year, the next step will be working on removing the building structures. What's called a limited hazmat, hazardous survey was com just completed and it checks for lead and asbestos prior to assembling a demolition contract. A small am amount of asbestos was found in the popcorn ceiling material uh, and that will be handled during the demo. Once this is complete, the final step will be working on the creek restoration, uh, side bank restoration along Rock Creek with um, restoring it back to natural vegetation. Once all the parts are received for our East Hill Well PLC replacement project, we'll be ready to go with our control system upgrade there. We're looking at a December or January time frame at our, um, so that our six million gallon reservoir is back online before we take this uh, down for a day uh, to do a swap over. Uh, and also the 516 project, which I'll touch on here in a second, out in coming time, we're waiting for that to be over. Because right now with that reservoir being offline, East Hill Well and Tacoma are primary sources for up on the 590 pressure zone. Another long lead time item for procurement has been our replacement for our radios for our control system. Our current radios uh, used for data communication between our 52 remote utility sites are no longer manufactured or supported. The new radios have been ordered and we expect to receive them by the end of the year. The new radios feature uh, a security improvement where it will scramble the data signal when it sends it and unscramble it when it receives it, so it will help protect that information. West Hill Reservoir. Since I was here last year, the steel shell of the reservoir was assembled, and this last July 1st, the roof was raised and placed on top. I was out there to watch that. It was pretty impressive. Once the roof was set in place, and welded, erection of the scaffolding followed and is close to being completed. I, I believe they're going to start working on the wrapping beginning the next week. Once the wrapping is complete, then they can start working on the coating and things of that nature. The control building has also been built and electrical work continues for the control system, the backup power generator, and a rechlorination system that will be put in place in case rechlorination of the water is necessary. Our next water main replacement project that will be going out to bid is for a 12-inch water main on North State Avenue between East James Street and just north of East George Street at the base of James, uh, the James Hill. This project is another in a series to increase fire flow availability across the system. There will also be three water main projects up on the East Hill crossing 104th Ave at Southeast 226th, Southeast 228th, and Southeast 232nd. Once these are complete, we have in-house shop sink water main projects that will tie into where these end uh, and go through the neighborhoods. We have main, uh, one remaining project for this year on Fifth Avenue, uh, and next year we have five more projects in the queue for our summer construction season. We continue to work with design engineering on the final location to site our West Hill booster station, and we'll begin to work on the design process for both it and the transmission main uh, needed to move water up Veterans Drive and down Military to the new reservoir. The current plan is for construction to begin in the 25-26 time frame. Last year we did take the opportunity to pre-install 500 feet of 16-inch diameter transmission main ahead of the Alexian Gateway development project up there uh, so we could be out of the way before any frontage improvements were made. I'll dig it up again. <laughs> Uh, construction has began, begun on the City of Covington's project to widen State Route 516 east of Wax Road. 
from Jenkins Creek to 185th place, which is the light at the in intersection where like Home Depot and the strip mall or businesses are there. This project impacts our Clark Springs, Kent Springs, and Armstrong Springs transmission mains. The project is being built in two phases to meet fish window restrictions within Jenkins Creek. The first phase this year will build the new northern portion of the creek crossing and relocate our Clark Springs transmission main. And then in the uh, two pictures on the right there, you can uh, see the utility trench to install the drop manholes and the 36 inch casing that our pipe will go through uh, under the creek. The second phase during next year's fish window will re relocate our Kent Springs and Armstrong Springs transmission mains. And staff have done a great job uh, exercising different sourcing options all year long, not just for the six million gallon one uh, tank project, but for this as well, we're gonna be having to move uh, sources around to make up for the water when Clark is turned off uh, for the up to 10 days they need for that tie-in connection. And finally, the Washington State Department of Transportation is working on a Highway 167-509 interchange project that was going to impact our Tacoma Pipeline 5 with a flyover ramp, um, but they have moved that ramp, so there is no more conflict. But we were made aware of two wash dock culvert crossing projects that will impl impact the Tacoma Pipeline 5. One at 509 and East Alexander in Tacoma, and one on Highway 169 out in Black Diamond. These projects are early, early in design and we don't have a firm construction date, but they're projected for 2025. So with that, that's a snapshot of things that we've accomplished or that are affecting the system. I think I got us back on time. <laughs> there are many projects happening in addition to the maintenance act, or many things happening in addition with maintenance activities, sampling, water treatment, things of that nature. Um, the guys are keeping very busy. So with that, you have to take any questions you may have. Thank you so much. We take a lot of things for granted, right? Water, right? But you guys do a really, really uh, good job of making sure we can't have the best water. So thank you so much. Any question, council member? Okay. Thank you so much, Sean. Appreciate it. Thanks. Yeah. See you next year. <laughs> ah. <Yeah. laughs> okay, we're going to adjourn until 7 o'clock. Thank you.